With this online lecture, we are looking at early Christian art that was produced at the end of the Roman Empire. Now, in terms of the relationship between Christianity and Roman, the Roman Empire, I want to start out by giving you some dates to kind of explain what's happening here. What's going on is that during the 3rd and 4th centuries CE, people began to, in larger numbers, reject paganism, or polytheism, I think is a more uh, appropriate term. And instead, they began to turn to the monotheistic religion of Christianity. Remember, monotheism is to worship one God. So more and more people began to convert to Christianity, and it becomes enough of a force that the powers that be that ruled over Rome had no choice but to acknowledge this growing religion. So what happens is, in the year 313, Emperor Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, which essentially allows for religious tolerance in the Roman Empire, saying that um, Christian Christianity would no longer be a persecuted religion, and that they were welcome to practice their religion, and the polytheists were welcome to practice their religion, etc. Now, things, though, begin to change rather quickly from this point on. Christianity, again, is legalized in 313. Christianity is named the official religion of Rome in 381. So we're talking like a little less than 70 years difference, which really isn't that long in the grand scheme of things. So Christianity is the official religion in 381. Polytheism is completely outlawed in 391, so just 10 short years later, and then Rome falls in 476, so less than 100 years um, after polytheism is outlawed, Rome falls. Now, in terms of the earliest of Christian art, we don't have a lot of, of early works. And the earliest works that we do have date to the 3rd and 4th centuries CE. Part of the reason why we don't have a lot of early Christian artwork is because at the outset the Christians were persecuted, and so they were a little bit more discreet in making art, um, or didn't really make very much at all. They didn't have churches or anything along those lines for us to study now. The majority of the art that we have found that dates to this early time period has been found in the catacombs. So the catacombs were this subterranean network of passageways where the Christians would bury their dead. And they did bury their dead. They did not practice cremation like we saw with the Etruscans. Much of the reason why catacomb artwork was protected why we still see it today is because the Romans did have a pretty nice, pretty diplomatic view of the catacombs in the sense that they viewed that death was something that people really shouldn't mess with. They appreciated the fact that the Roman or the Christians were being discreet about their burial practices. They were burying their dead underground. And so the Romans really let them be when it came to burying their dead. And so the catacombs remained relatively undisturbed, which is great because this is a wealth of information that it provides to us about early Christian art. Now, inside the catacombs, they were not plain. They did adorn them with mural paintings, fresco paintings, so tomb paintings, just like what we saw with the Etruscans, with the Egyptians, etc. Now, this is an interesting catacomb painting because of the very specific organization of the composition, which is organized in a cross or cruciform shape. It almost looks like a spoked wheel, but you can see here the cross shape, the cruciform shape. Now, outside of the cruciform shape, we have these people right in here, and these people were meant to represent the cross-section of your average Christian family. They have their arms raised, and this is a gesture of prayer. So what's happening is they are showing what one is expected to do, to pray, as an entry point into the afterlife, heaven. So this is a very appropriate subject matter for a tomb painting. Now, at the ends of our cruciform, we have these half-moon shapes, which are called lunettes. Now, in our half-moon shapes, we have varying images from the Old Testament story of Jonah, Jonah and the whale. The basic premise of Jonah and the whale is there's this guy, Jonah. 
He gets eaten by a whale. Now you would expect that that would be something that would kill you, but miraculously, three days later, the whale spits Jonah out. The story of Jonah and the whale is extremely popular in early Christian funerary imagery. Why do you think that that could be the case? If you're thinking that it could be a representation or reference to rebirth, you would be absolutely correct. Now in the middle here of the the cruciform shape, we have Jesus as the Good Shepherd. These are very common Christian art images that show Jesus as a shepherd leading a flock of sheep with one sheep around his shoulders. The idea behind this is with Jesus as the Good Shepherd, he's shown as this very kind and benevolent caretaker. Caretaker in this case of humanity. So if you imagine yourself, if you were one of the sheep in Jesus' flock and you went astray, Jesus wouldn't just say, okay, bye, and just leave you to die or get eaten by some sort of predatory animal. Jesus would come and he would get you and he would bring you back to join the flock. If you think about what this story is really saying, you can see that there are narratives in here that refer to forgiveness, acceptance, this idea that you could make errors and mistakes and that you would be forgiven, that you would still be allowed to be part of the flock, you would still be protected, all of these things that make people feel really good. And so this was a, an image that had a lot of resonance with a lot of people. Now it's kind of a hard image to really make out clearly because of the poor quality of the fresco. But this idea of the man with the animal over the shoulder, is this the first time that we're ever seeing this motif in the history of art? The answer to this is no. Here's a more clearer view and you can see that actually it's based off of religious images that come from polytheistic religions. This is a Greek image, calf bearer from the archaic period, where we see a man with an animal over his shoulders. And this is a religious image believed to be a man bringing an offering to the goddess Athena. So this religious image is simply recontextualized. The image is replicated, but now it's being communicated in a Christian context. This is something that actually is very common in Christian art. A lot of Christian art motifs are not unique to Christian art. They're actually copies or replications of pre-existing motifs from earlier cultures. Why would they be doing something like this? Well, first of all, Christian art is not exactly new on the scene. In the third and fourth centuries, we're already looking at over 30,000 years of art production. And so they are going to be influenced by their predecessors, and they are going to replicate what, things have done, what people have done before. The other thing, though, is we are looking at a moment of transition, where there are a lot of people who are polytheists, and then there are more and more people that are becoming Christian. This was a way to ease the path into conversion. It was much easier to adopt the Christian faith when you could see images that were familiar to you as a pagan or a polytheist, where you could see these images and you would have this familiar point of reference to which you could understand a new set of religious beliefs. Here are some photographs of the interior of the catacombs. These catacombs, these burial places for the Christian dead, were very extensive. In Rome, the catacombs spanned from 60 to 90 miles. And it's believed that we haven't even discovered all the catacombs that were created at this time. 60 to 90 miles. Once they reached that point and they ran out of room horizontally to span, then they began to build downward. And there are some parts of the catacombs that go four stories below ground. So this is an extremely expansive network burial sites. These were built primarily from the 2nd to 4th centuries and at their height they housed as many as 4 million people underground. Now the catacombs were for all classes of Roman Christian individuals. But if you were a more upper class individual you did have the option of being put into a sarcophagus and then put down into the catacombs. And so here we have an example of an early Christian sarcophagus that contains New and Old Testament scenes together. 
Now, Old and New Testament scenes, okay, this has to do with the Bible. There's the Old Testament of the Bible, which is biblical narratives prior to the birth of Jesus. New Testament scenes are biblical narratives after the birth of Jesus. Very, very common to have both Old and, Testament, Old and New Testament scenes together in one work of art. We even saw that in the catacomb painting that we just looked at. Old Testament story of Jonah and the whale, the New Testament story of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Now, in terms of the sarcophagi, they were, for the most part, mass-produced in the sense that there would be workshops that would create these sarcophagi. And then if you were a wealthy Christian, you're thinking about the end, preparing for death, you could go to these workshops and you could purchase a sarcophagus. What they would do is then once you purchase the sarcophagus, they would carve onto the, sar the sarcophagus the likeness of your image to personalize it. Now in this sarcophagus, you can see this blank face right here. This indicates that this sarcophagus was never purchased. If this was the sarcophagus, say, that you had purchased, they would come in, they would carve your likeness, and this would personalize your sarcophagus. So here we have whoever this was going to belong to. And you can see that just like in the catacomb painting we were looking at earlier, the arms are raised in the gesture of prayer, this activity that needs to be done consistently so that one can go to the afterlife. Over here, we have Jonah and the whale. Here he's coming out of the whale. Over here, this should look familiar to us, guy with animal over shoulders, Jesus is the good shepherd, and here, this is the baptism of Jesus. Now here in the middle, we have a motif that's known as seated philosopher. This motif, seated philosopher, does have its origins in classical art, Greece. Classical Greek art, they would commonly make these sculptures of seated philosophers, philosophers that were engaged in reading or writing or thinking. This was something that was carried on into the Roman Empire, and this was a motif that's recontextualized in early Christian art. Whereas when you see this, it's no longer the seated philosopher, but it will usually be one of the authors of the Bible, particularly one of the four apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So this is some sort of biblical author that's in the process of writing the Bible. Now with this reuse of the classical theme of the seated philosopher, it brings me to the point that when we look at early Christian Roman art, there is a lot of classical influence. That artistic tradition remains, it doesn't go away. It's simply like classical sculpture that is now telling Christian themes. So if you look, try to see if you can identify things that feel very classical to you. You may have noticed things like the musculature. And look how dramatic Jonah is. This is so Hellenistic Greece. We have the contrapposto stance. We have drapery that's being used to define and reveal form. Here's some more emphasized musculature. Now in terms of sculpture in the round, early Christian sculpture in the round is extremely rare. It's extremely rare because sculpture in the round um, was seen as being kind of dangerous, that it kind of put you in this sort of dangerous territory of perhaps worshiping false idols. Because of this, we don't really see hardly any sculpture in the round in the early Christian period. And in fact, this is something that we can say throughout the majority of the Middle Ages. We do start to see a little bit of return to um, sculpture in the round in the middle middle ages but for the most part sculpture that is not somehow attached to or affiliated with architecture remains very rare until the Renaissance so this is a very rare work of art because it's sculpture in the round now of course it's a religious work of art we have Christ seated now this sculpture indicates just like our sarcophagus from the previous slide that we do have a um, classical influence this is yet another replication of the seated philosopher motif where Jesus is seated. He was originally holding some sort of text. The other thing though I want to point out that's very important here is the way that Jesus is represented. So if you look here, this is not how we might be more accustomed to seeing Jesus represented. 
Most of the time when we think about representations of Jesus, we think of him as an older man, and that um, older age is indicated through the presence of the beard. The beard is not something that appears initially in early Christian art. Earliest images of Jesus show him young and unbearded. We will not see the emergence of bearded Jesus until the Byzantine period. Now, prior to the legalization of Christianity, as I said, we do not see church structures being built because this is a persecuted religion. So uh, the practice of the religion had to be very discreet, where we are seeing um, people practicing their religion in the privacy of homes. Sometimes they would also practice the religion down in the catacombs. Now, once Christianity is legalized in the year 313, we have the immediate need to build above ground churches. So this was something that Constantine, the first Christian emperor of Rome, made sure to undertake and to undertake rather quickly. You'll see within the date that he's building Old St. Peter's about seven years after the issuing of the Edict of Milan. Now, it was important to build these churches to accommodate all of the people who are converting to the faith and to create churches that were large enough to fit people. Old St. Peter's, when it was built, was the largest structure in all of Christendom, and it was able to accommodate between three and 4,000 people. That is humongous. Now, in terms of the placement of Old St. Peter's, this is significant. It's significant because it has it's placed on what was believed to be the burial site of St. Peter. St. Peter factored in very prominently to the religious faith because he was believed to be the person who established the first Christian community in Rome. And he's also considered to be like the first pope. That Jesus gives to St. Peter the keys to heaven, so to speak, as this gesture that St. Peter is the sort of gatekeeper of Christianity here on earth. And that this was something that St. Peter passed on to the next Pope, who passes on to the next Pope, who passes on to the next Pope. So much so that our current Pope, St. Francis, is the next in this legacy of people who have descended down from St. Peter. So this gives the Pope and the Pope's office an incredible amount of power to be directly linked as a descendant to St. Peter, who Jesus personally himself chose. So the placement of St. Peter's on St. Peter's burial site helps to give it that very important symbolism of power, power over earthly Christendom. Now it's called Old St. Peter's because the plan that you see here, the drawing here, is not the St. Peter's that you would see if you went to um, Rome today and had a look. The um, Old St. Peter's was actually um, going over a continuous amount of renovations. This was happening as early as the 9th century. And we don't really see the complete rebuilding until the 16th century, and then the ultimate finish happens um, in the Renaissance. So what you would see today if you went to Rome would be a combination of Renaissance and 16th century Baroque architecture. So with this church, what's important about it is that the design creates this common form of architecture that we see replicated again and again from this point forward. And in fact, even today, when you look at very typical Christian churches, they do reflect a lot of the architectural features that we see here at St. Peter's. So there's three types of architectural structures that are built during the early Christian period. You have the Latin cross plan, the basilica plan, and the central plan. This is an example of a Latin cross plan. I'll explain what this means. Now, first of all, ignore all this stuff. We aren't going to cover it. We're just going to look at this part up in here. Okay, Latin cross plan. And it's easy to think of the Latin cross plan because it's shaped like a cross or cruciform. Now, in the Latin cross plan, part of what gives it this cross appearance is the nave. And the nave is the center part right in here. That's the nave. And it may be helpful to you in your notes to draw pictures of this. This is what I usually recommend. So here's the nave here. In this view, it's this part right in here. The nave. 
the nave was where people sat. So it makes sense that this is going to be the largest area of the interior because it needs to accommodate the most people. That's the nave. Next we have the aisles, okay, which are on either side of the nave. Here we are our aisles here. The aisles allowed for people to walk around the church without disturbing the people who are sitting in the nave. Then we have the apse, which is located back here at the end of the nave. This is probably the better view down here, the semicircular recess that it again is at the back of the nave. The apse is arguably the most important space within the church because the apse is what holds the altar. The altar was like the focal point. The people in the nave sat and faced the altar. This was the site from which religious rituals were uh, conducted during service. The apse. Then we have the transept, which is this perpendicular arm that we see right here. The function of the transept was um, kind of like whatever, whatever they wanted to use it for. You could use it for seating people if you ran out of space in the nave. You also could use the transept to display relics, holy objects, that people could look at as part of their overall religious experience. Now I will say this, the Latin cross plan is not very frequently used. We do not see a regular usage of the Latin cross plan until the Romanesque period, which is the 11th and 12th centuries. The more common plan that's used initially is the basilica plan. The basilica plan is basically everything that you see here, but no transept. So basically, the basilica plan is one long rectangle. It has the nave, it has the aisles, it has the apse, just does not have the transept. So, basilica plan looks like a rectangle, Latin cross plan looks like a cross. Finally, we have the clerestory, a row of windows here at the top. This is not something that we see for the first time in architecture. This actually is a uh, form or a feature of architecture that has a long standing history. And I bet you could guess where we first see the clerestory in architecture. And if you guessed Egypt, you would be correct. Now let's talk about this idea of the basilica. Okay, the basilica is also not a form that we first see appearing in architecture in um, early Christian art. The basilica actually is originally a Greek structure. 3rd century BCE Greece. It was imported into Rome and was a feature of most Roman towns. The basilica, which we can see right here in the form of Trajan, was a secular structure. It was not used for religious purposes. It was used as an administrative government building, most often for judicial purposes. You can see that the basilica's form is the same. Here's the nave, there's the apse, there's the clerestory. So the question then becomes, why? We are in Rome, which literally has some sort of polytheistic temple on every single corner. Why didn't they just move in to the pre-existing structures? Why did they take the basilica, which had no religious affiliation, and use that as their new church structures? Well, there's two reasons for this. Okay, One is a practical reason, one is a symbolic reason. Practically, this worked because they simply could fit more people. This is a long rectangular shape, you could fit more people in, whereas polytheistic temples tended to be smaller in size. And we know the reason for this. Polytheistic temples were conceived of as homes for the gods, not homes for the worshipers. So they were small in size because they didn't need to accommodate many people. Often, worship took place on the exterior. Here, though, with Christian churches, these now begin to be conceived of as homes for the worshipers, and so they had to be large in size to accommodate the people. Now, the second reason we see the usage of the basilica is because it allowed for the Christian faith to have a structure that did not have any pre-existing context. You don't want to take the pantheon and use it as a church because the whole time everyone's going to be thinking about polytheistic gods and not the monotheistic god. So it was a way to have quite a, a clean start, fresh break, and have structures that did not have a specific religious context already attached to them. Now this is our third plan. So we had the Latin cross plan that's shaped like a cross. We have the basilica plan that's shaped like a rectangle. And then we have the central plan, which is shaped like a circle or a square. 
What kind of structure would we call a central plan most often? If you said rotunda, you would be correct. So here is a central plan structure. And the central plan structures were not used very often either. Easily the most commonly used structure is the basilica. The central plan would often be built as sort of a supplemental structure that was kind of like attached to or affiliated with a basilica plan. We don't see central plans being used very often simply because they don't accommodate many people. Now, in a central plan structure, often, but not always, you'll have your central area here, and then you'll have this exterior part here that's known as an ambulatory. The central part and the ambulatory are divided by columns. And if we can go back for a minute, you can see here the same sort of situation is happening, where the division of the nave and the aisles is through a row of columns or a colonnade. So the similar thing is happening here. The ambulatory has the same function as the aisles. This allows for people to walk around and to not disturb people in the center. Here's a detail of the ceiling, the gorgeous mosaics. And I, I want to show you this for a couple reasons. There's a couple reasons why this is important. First of all, I want to talk to you about the common um, form of adornment, or decoration that we see in early Christian structures. What we tend to see is that early Christian structures are very plain on the outside. Not a lot of structural or sculptural embellishment, not a lot of fancy decorations, very plain. But on the inside, super beautiful, super gorgeous. And most of this is super beautiful, gorgeous mosaics, like the one we see here. So plain on the outside, fancy on the inside. Now I wanted to show you this also, just to give you an idea, again, of this idea of similarity of image and concept between polytheistic and Christian art. So here we have at the center this portrait. We don't know who it is. But what we do see all around this person is all of these references to wine. Now this was something that if a polytheistic person was looking at, they would understand this in the context of Bacchus, the wine god. People are harvesting the grapes, they're transporting them, they're smashing them. Wine god Bacchus. Now if you were Christian looking at this image, you would interpret this as the Eucharist, right? This religious ritual that talks about wine, wine that's transformed into the blood of Christ, which is then ingested by the followers as an important part of religious practice. So there's kind of dual meanings here in a way. And again, it's that representation of transitional imagery, this idea that we can go from sort of polytheistic images that now can be understood in this new Christian context.